Hello. I am so excited that you are here today. I am here with my friend Mir Kamen, the mastermind behind Want Not and Woulda Coulda Shoulda. Mir is a full-time freelance blogger as well as a personal blogger, and she is here joining us today on episode three of Real Moms Making Real Money at Home in Their Pajamas and How You Can Too. Thank you so much, Mir, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so, in the interest of full disclosure, it is 5.08 a.m. in California and 8.08 a.m. in Atlanta. Um, I have had way too much coffee. And, uh, Mir, how much coffee have you had today? Uh, I've had a cup and a half. I think you're ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, my dog just jumped up in my lap. She wanted to Ooh. be her too. <laughs> Hello, Licorice. How are you? Confused. So Licorice is a bit of a uh, an internet celebrity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad he's here. So Mir, um, in a nutshell, you needed to start working from home, and you turned to writing. And how did that all come about? And how did you go from being scared to death that you weren't going to make a dime to now working more than full time writing all over the place? I think when people tell me, oh, you know, I could never do it and it's too risky and it's too hard, I like to, to tell them my story because I wasn't somebody who went, I think I can and I'm, I'm going to do it and it's all going to be okay. I sort of went every other route beforehand trying to find a more conventional job. And I was writing this personal blog because that was an interest of mine, but I never thought I could make a living as a writer. And what happened was as I took these other jobs that just weren't compatible with my life as a single mom to two small kids or, uh, were, you know, I, I have a, I have a couple of fancy degrees and I was taking jobs that were, you know, fairly well beneath what I had trained to do because those were the only jobs I could get. Mm -hmm. And for me, it took several really awful corporate experiences to say, you know what? Freelancing can't be worse than this. It's, I, I kind of had to hit that bottom to say, I'm just going to go for it. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but it can't possibly be worse than what I'm doing now. And for me, that was the process I needed to go through because I am not a risk taker by nature. One of the reasons I love talking to people about freelancing and, and sort of the inherent risk is that I am a very play it safe person. So I, I try to tell people the takeaway is that if I can make a living doing this and if I can find a way to structure it so that I'm not constantly, you know, curled up in a little ball in the corner, really anybody can. I appreciate that about you. Um, I appreciate that you're straightforward and you're honest, that you were scared and you were nervous and you weren't jumping into this blindly. You took the time to research, okay, well, now I need to figure out health and now I need to figure out a savings plan and a retirement fund and, and all of these different things just to have the framework in place. Um, and you've done a phenomenal job. And one thing you set, you uh, kind of cut yourself short about with your fancy degrees is you are one of the best writers I have ever read. I am amazed each time I click on one of your links, like, oh, there's Mir again, and you are not phoning it in. You can write about anything, and not only do I want to buy it, um, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm entertained, I'm fascinated, um, I love the way your brain works, I love your parenthetical statements, because that's how I think also. Um, you have had many blogging opportunities that people would dream of. You've gotten a free kitchen. You've gotten to go on lots of different trips. Um, you've worked with some very huge companies like the Milk Foundation or, or what, what it, three a day. Actually, what is it? It's threeaday.org. Okay. Yeah, that's huge. The Milk Foundation. <laughs> about, and I don't want any details, but when someone approaches you and wants you to write for them, how is how does the negotiation part work, and how do you make sure that you're not selling yourself short? There's a lot of different things you have to think about. I think first and foremost, and again, this is for me, but I, I 
this one I would say kind of kind of goes for anybody who wants it to be a, a long term thing in this field. You have to decide: is this a company that I would patronize, that I w- or a product that I would use, or you know, even if it didn't involve working for them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have a friend who's a vegan, and so when I did the three-a-day thing, we we had a party here, and, you know, she was kind of busting on me. How come you didn't invite me? As a joke, because she doesn't consume milk products, but my family actually eats a lot of dairy. So for me, that was, that was a good fit. Mm-hmm. Um, I have certainly turned down opportunities that I just felt like, you know, it's not for me. This is not a product that I use. Um, there are... Uh, not going to name any names. There are certain stores that I won't list on whatnot because I don't shop at them and that have a corporate philosophy that is not okay with me. So those stores are never going to be featured there, no matter how much money I could potentially make from that. So that's the first thing. Is this a good fit for me personally? And a lot of people talk to you about, is this a good fit for my brand? You know, as as someone who writes for a living, I feel like who you are and who your brand is, for most of us, it's not going to be that different. Yeah. The whole right? brand thing has turned a little obnoxious. Um, I agree. Is that, okay, is that okay to say? Yeah. <laughs> you are Mir Kamen. You are you. You have a fantastic husband that the Internet loves. Um, <laughs> you've got probably the world's best dad outside of my own. Um, and and you've got these kids. You're a person. And, um, and I get the branding thing, but I think it comes across uh, a, a little in your face online. I, um, I agree. I think the people who are very much about brands are building something that at the end of the day isn't always authentic. And I think readers can tell that for sure. I think even marketers and companies can tell that sometimes. So for me, I don't sit around thinking about my brand. I, I think about what am I okay with at the end of the day? How, how is it okay for me to go to bed at night and not be kept up thinking, did I do something that, that wasn't okay? Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for saying that out loud, and, and thank you for being that role model, because I truly believe uh, that is what's important. At the end of the day, you need to know that you did something right for you and for your family. Um, and the pieces fall in place. They always will. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think... I think that's the rule rather than the exception. I think we hear a lot about the people who are about brands and, and, you know, decisions that maybe people question, but I don't think that's the norm. I think most of the people working in this field, certainly the ones who maintain that longevity, Mm -hmm. that's how they're conducting themselves. Right. And I tend to be a fairly cynical person, but really on, on, on this, I believe that, that most of the people who are getting the jobs and, you know, maintaining a life this way really are making decisions based upon, you know, a, an inner moral guidance and, and not on what's going to make them the most money. Morals are good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I, I highly recommend having some morals. So. <laughs> yeah. So that's obviously the first thing when right. you're going to, you know, talk to somebody about a potential gig. Right. So assuming that it's a product, a company, whatever that you're okay with, you know, then there should be a written contract. This is something that a lot of newbies are uncertain about or feel like, do we really need to do it? Or, oh, they gave me a contract. I didn't even read it. I went ahead and signed it. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, it's the contract is for your protection as well as for the company's. So the second thing that I look at is that if it's the kind of gig where they're going to be looking for very personal sort of writing from me or writing on my own sites, okay, it's, it's very typical for a contract to have some verbiage in there that gives the people that you're working for total rights to your work. Right. Gives them complete copyright in some cases or yeah. full license. And there'll be a line in there about how they can use it in any medium at any time into perpetuity. Mm-hmm. If it's something I'm writing on my site, for me personally, that's not going to be okay. If it's on my site, I retain the copyright. If it's going to be on their site, I have to think about, is this the kind of thing I might want to use for something else at some point? Right. Um, there are, go ahead. This is uh, especially important, and I know you're not a recipe writer, but uh, many of my readers are. If you are a recipe writer, you need to know upfront. Who owns the recipe that you're creating? Exactly. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I tend to shy away from things where I give away complete rights, unless it's the sort of writing where it's on somebody else's site, it's on a topic that I don't write about on my sites. You, you have to make a judgment call. But in general, if somebody's asking me to write about my family, mm -hmm. if somebody is asking me to, like in the case of the appliances, you know, write about it on my site, mm -hmm. you know, that's my site. I retain copyright. Um, you also need to be careful, depending on the client, about this whole in any medium into perpetuity thing because you don't want your face, your words to end up on an advertisement for which, you know, that PR firm is being paid thousands, perhaps tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for something that you created. Right. So it, it's just something to be aware of in terms of in terms of contract. And there are other contract things, too, you know, how long the term is and how they can fire you, how you can get out of the contract. That's, you know, basic business stuff. Right. Um, you also have made it a business model that you don't usually blog for stuff. You, you blog for income. Yes, that, that's true. When, when people, um, when people approach me and say, we'd like you to write about product X and we'll give you a product X, mm -hmm. I say no. I mean, I, I don't do any of that on my personal blog because my personal blog is, is not a place to write about products. You've um, always done very well at separating church from state. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's part of the reason I love having those two separate blogs is because I'm very much a everything has a place kind of person. Isn't and, it interesting to you when you find readers don't know of the other site? <laughs> it, it, it yeah. They're like, wow, wow, that's you. <laughs> yeah, it's a little interesting. I would say in general, there's a good crossover between the audiences, but um, more and more I'll have want not readers who've never read Woulda, Coulda, Shoulda and are like, wow, I had no idea. <laughs> because to me, I hear your voice in my head. And it's just so obvious that, of course, it's your writing. Um, but yeah. Now, um, as far as some of your regular full-time gigs, um, you are a blogger contributor. You write for the cornered office on Work at Mom. Mm -hmm. You have contracts in place with both of those companies, and, and I know a quite a few others. I'm just um, using them as an example right now. How? When you wake up in the morning, how do you frame your day? Do you always start with your own personal stuff and get that done and over with? Um, does it vary? Do you try to stick to a schedule? I do try to stick to a schedule. I have an assigned day of the week that I write for Blog Her. And for some of my other gigs, I get periodic assignments. Um, some are more free-flowing than other. For, for anything that I have a deadline, I'll put it on my calendar. And when I get up in the morning, it's on my calendar. Okay, today I have to write for Blogger. Today I have a piece due for Daily Gromit, you know, something like that. Um, I don't tend to start with that. I usually, when I get up, I start with WantNot. Oh, and, interesting. Yeah, well, because WantNot is where I post the most. Mm -hmm. And so since I'm looking to get between four and eight posts up a day there, I usually, you know, I start something to start the day and I'll, I'll I, go back. I got, this, I got this sweater from Land's End through WantNot, so thank you. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's covering my jammies. <laughs> so I tend to start with that. And then depending on the gig is where it'll fit into my day. It, it's funny, for someone who's so structured, I would say that my writing day is is probably – dog is trying to eat my computer. I'm going to put her down. <laughs> uh, how I structure where I write when is probably the most free-flowing part of my day because that's the, that's the little bit of the inspiration. You know, what do I feel like writing about right now? Do I have everything I need to finish this assignment? Would I rather go surf around on the web and look for some inspiration first? You know, do, did something happen this week that I really want to write about for Wooda? Right. Um, so it's, it's definitely not the same every day. On the, on the rare occasion that we take a vacation or say it's in the summer and the kids are home and I really have to have my schedule be a lot tighter, I'll be better about that. I'll, okay. you know, sort of lay it out and go, okay, I'm going to spend an hour on this, and then I'm going to spend an hour on this, and then I'm going to do these things, and then I'm going to put the computer away for the day. <laughs> and you're going to load your crockpot, which I always appreciate. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for the crockpot plug. Um, the, the last thing that I really wanted um, to pick your brain just a little bit is I read your column on um, the cornered office 
that you did just the other day on picking a blogging conference. Yeah. And um, you and I met at um, one of the blog her conferences, and I uh, was so excited to meet you because here you are. Oh my gosh, it's me! And um, <laughs> I believe I started reading Woulda Coulda Shoulda. We were in another house, so that was 2005. When did yeah. you begin? Uh, 2004. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And um. One of the reasons I was instantly drawn to you at this conference is you were very open, very gracious, very caring. I was total fangirl. I had emailed you <laughs> out of the blue once, and you responded within like six minutes. And I'm like, ah, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, um, so thank you. Um, and then if, if you're a, a newish blogger and you're trying to network and get to know other bloggers in your niche, what would you recommend keeping in mind before you drop thousands of dollars to fly across the country? <clears throat> um, this is, this is, as you know, a really multifaceted topic, which is one of the reasons that I, that I wrote a post about it. Yes. And, and you, and you and I have also talked about staying true to, to sort of what your tolerances are personally. You know, I, I tell people I'm an introvert and they laugh and laugh and then I go, no, no, really, really I am an introvert. Like for me, going to a conference where there are thousands of people, it's not that I never do it. I do it sometimes. Sometimes there are reasons for me to do it, but it's not where I'm most comfortable. Adam it's wants certain... to go to Blog World so then he can go to Vegas. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He says, husband... you just go to that? I'm like, have you seen the ticket price? <laughs> Well, it's expensive, and, and the whole world is there. You know, my husband is going to South by Southwest this year, and he said, Ooh. do you want to go too? And I said, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's great, and he's much more outgoing than I am, so I'm sure it's the kind of thing he'll really enjoy. He has specific reasons for going, but what I try to tell people is that if you're a little shy, if you're a little – because, uh, and that's a whole other conversation. I'm not shy. It's just lots and lots of people kind of drain me of energy. So if you're shy or if you're introverted – and especially if you've never been to a conference before, mm -hmm. to pick one that has thousands of attendees for your first conference is probably not a good idea. I think this ties into understanding what it is beforehand you want to get out of that conference. There are people who, who I read, who I would consider blogging superstars, who don't know me from Adam. Ooh, ooh, can we and, use the word web liberty? Yeah, <laughs> web liberty. I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> And, and when I go to conferences where those people are, I try really hard not to do the, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm meeting you. I can't believe I'm meeting you. Because people have done that to me, and it makes me tremendously uncomfortable. I, I think it, it bears remembering, too, that it's the rare person that's 100% at their best when surrounded by strangers. Mm -hmm. Look right? at Kate Godwin. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. What a bum. That's someone who's really into her brand. So. <laughs> and I, I think, too, if you're going into a conference with the idea that there's sort of two different levels, right? There's the, the fangirl squee of, I want to meet this person just because I think they're awesome, and it would be cool to meet them. And then there's the, I want to meet this person because they're doing something I want to do, and I wonder if they would be willing to mentor me or answer a specific question. And if you're looking at that, I think it's perfectly fine to approach people. Again, it's, it's a matter of common sense, being sensitive to are they having a conversation with someone else? Are they on their way somewhere else? Do they just not seem like talking right now? I'm kind of an, uh, a reality show junkie right now. I like it that I can turn my brain off. I used to like Survivor and, and the contest shows, but now I'm, I'm kind of liking the candid reality shows of the Kardashians and the Real Housewives. And I'm sure it's all a setup. I get it. But a lot of what I think I'm drawn to is um, it, it's similar to personal blogging. Um, they're, they're putting aspects of themselves out there and letting the camera follow them around. And a lot of people use the Internet that way and they just kind of dump it all out and um, and sometimes they are fishing for drama sometimes they will take a very strong opinion for no other reason except for that they do kind of want to stir the pot and um, start some drama and I've always liked that about you is that you 
are honest to a certain extent, but you're aware that your readers may or may not agree with you. And while controversy sometimes arises, that's not something you're trying to do. It just sometimes happens. Yes. Was there a question there? No. (laughs) That's Stephanie O'Day with three cups of coffee at 5.30 (laughs) a.m. Well, and to, to, to sort of work off of that, one of the things that when we talked about this before, you said, don't you think blogging is like that? And my response was, actually, I don't, because with reality shows, again, you know, maybe it's all set up. But theoretically, they can capture stuff on camera just because they're there all the time Mm -hmm. that the people maybe don't feel comfortable about sharing, but because they've signed the contracts and whatever, it ends up on the show. Whereas with blogging, if I don't want it out there, it never goes out there. Yes. Right. You you are your ultimate editor. And um, at at the same time, um, think, think before you blog and uh what, what is it? Friends don't let friends blog uh, drunk or tweet yeah. drunk or Facebook <laughs> drunk or, or any of those things. So um, remember, your your digital footprint stays forever. And even if you delete a tweet or delete a post, it could still live in someone's RSS feed or it still could have been captured with a screenshot. So um, everything is out there. And yeah. that can be scary or it can be really kind of neat and exhilarating that you're leaving these little tiny thumbprints and footprints all over the place that, hey, I was here. And um, and that's kind of neat for future generations to be able to see. Yeah. And I think one thing that newbie bloggers have sometimes have a hard time remembering, too, is that you can be authentic without being 100% transparent. Yeah. Right? People don't need to know about your bowel movements. They really yeah. don't. <laughs> I, I made that mistake. I used to hang out on a message board, and I, I talked about that way too much. And I'm like, dude, seriously, Stephanie? But, you know, that's what I was in my 20s. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, do, uh, okay, now we're totally off tangent. But have you ever seen, and in, in, it's actually an example of very good copywriting, that um, – like colon cleanse pill, and uh, it shoots everything out, and then there's photos of, yeah, people have submitted their photos. But after (laughs) doing some research one night when I really should have been asleep, evidently the pill, like, creates this stuff that then it tells you in to go look for. I, I mean, it is probably the best example of, sensational buy it now copywriting that I've read and they hit their mark. <laughs> People buy it. People upload their photos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right, I'll send you the link. It, yeah. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. <laughs> All right. On that note, Mir, thank you so much for spending your morning with me. I really appreciate it. <gasps> the baby's you. waking up, so um this is good timing. But um, oh, gosh, you are fantastic. So thank you. I'm gonna hire you. I'm gonna hire you to do my PR because I I, do, <laughs> I feel all warm and fuzzy now. You, oh, good. Like you should. I'm gone. <laughs> you should. Thank you. Bye, Stephanie. Alrighty. Bye bye.